My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. And so, for a lot of the ultra marathon, I faced a lot of adversity, but I knew that with all the funds that had been raised and with all the amazing donors that we had, that I had to keep going. I also knew in my heart that the Palestinians can't give up, and so neither can I. You know, what they're facing is... That's the voice of Russell Labus. He and Michael Buchert are today's guests on Talking Radical Radio. This show brings you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are involved in many different struggles, talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening can strengthen all of our efforts to change the world. Lavis lives in Toronto, and Buchert is based in Montreal. Both are very involved in solidarity work with the Palestinian people, but in quite different ways. In the last few months, there's been a surge of solidarity with the people of Palestine, perhaps an unprecedented one. This is a result of one of those periodic bouts of mainstream attention to the issue, sparked in this case by a series of acutely oppressive actions by the Israeli state and resistance by Palestinians. The most immediate events included Israeli efforts to displace Palestinian families from two neighborhoods of East Jerusalem to allow Israeli settlers to take their place, Palestinian mobilization to block the evictions, and a harsh Israeli crackdown that included violent raids on worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan. All of this sparked a broader escalation in violence, including rockets fired by Hamas and a brutal and deadly Israeli assault on the civilian population of the Gaza Strip. These recent events take place in a much broader context. Though there is plenty of history that could be told, underlying the conflict are past and present imperial domination of the Middle East by various Western countries and Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid. Though the application of the latter term to Israel has sparked controversy in years past, there is growing recognition of its accuracy, as both B'Tselem, an important human rights organization within Israel, and Human Rights Watch, a very mainstream global human rights group, have begun to use it. For Levis, his approach to solidarity is very much connected to who he is. A few years ago, he took up running and instantly loved it. Within a few months, he had run a half marathon, and he's been running longer and longer distances over the years since. Levis's mother and sister have both been involved in Palestinian solidarity organizing in the past, and it was his mother, he said, who pointed out, quote, I have this talent for running, and so why don't we use it to raise funds for Palestinians, end quote. Most recently, he has raised money for the Help Gaza Breathe campaign by running an ultramarathon. Help Gaza Breathe is a collaboration of the CJPME Foundation, which is a Canadian charitable organization that has a broad human rights and humanitarian mandate, with the Public Service Alliance of Canada's Social Justice Fund and other partners. It is part of a broader effort to build a medical oxygen facility at the Haifa Medical Center in Gaza, which is desperately necessary in the context of COVID-19. On May 22, 2021, Levis ran 110 kilometers and raised $31,000 for the campaign. Buchert grew up in a progressive Mennonite community in Saskatoon, and from early on was exposed to faith-based groups with close ties to partners in Palestine. His solidarity work has been scholarly in character and has taken on more conventionally recognizable grassroots political forms. He did a PhD studying the boycott movement against South African apartheid that took place in the 1980s, and the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS movement, against Israeli apartheid in more recent years. And he is currently the Vice President of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, or CJPME, an organization that since 2002 has worked to promote justice, peace, and development, both in the Middle East and in Canada. And uh, CJPME and the CJPME Foundation are separate organizations, though the former supports the charitable work of the latter. CJPME has particularly focused on policy advocacy and public education, raising concerns related to the occupation, apartheid, and other human rights abuses, and advocating for a just political solution. Buchert is all for expressing solidarity via providing humanitarian assistance to the people of Palestine, describing it as, quote, a very important component given the challenges, end quote. 
But he says that solidarity must also be, quote, about politics, about using our voice to challenge our government to try to change policies which are complicit with the Israeli policies that oppress Palestinians, end quote. He hopes to see growing numbers of Canadians pressuring their members of parliament, supporting a growing labor movement call to end arms sales to Israel, and advocating in their communities and unions for other kinds of participation in the BDS campaign. I speak with Levis and Buchert about events in Palestine, about the Help Gaza Breathe campaign, and about solidarity. My name is Russell Levis. I'm an ultramarathoner. I'm very passionate about running. In my day job, I'm an event sales manager for online conferences. I'm a passionate social justice advocate. That's how I ended up supporting the Help Gaza Breathe campaign the campaign through the CJPME Foundation, and all of the funds from the campaign go to the Haifa Medical Hospital in Gaza. I was beyond happy and overwhelmed with the amount of funds that we were able to raise through the ultramarathon event tied to this campaign. So how I got started with social justice work, there's a fantastic organization called Just Peace Advocates. And my mother is the executive director of it. And a couple of years ago, my mom and I were talking and we were saying, well, so I have this talent for running. And so why don't we use it to raise funds for Palestinians? And I said, well, I'd love to do that. The CJPME Foundation is actually the third event that I've supported Palestinians. The first event was in May of 2020. It was in support of Just Peace Advocates, my mother's organization. I ran a marathon. I loved the opportunity to support Palestinians. And so in November, I did another event, and this was through World Vision Canada. It was a 100-kilometer ultramarathon, and it was in support of their offices in the West Bank and Gaza, and we were able to raise $10,000. I was completely overwhelmed and, and just beyond happy about that support. So then from there, my mom, who's connected to Thomas Woodley, who's the executive director of the CJPME Foundation, we began to plan for this next event. My name is Michael Buchert. I'm vice president of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, which is a national grassroots organization based in Montreal, Quebec. I joined the organization about a year ago. Before that, I was in Ottawa doing a PhD in sociology, looking at how different boycott movements have been contested and debated in Canada, comparing the anti-apartheid movement in the 80s and some of the rhetoric and pro-apartheid lobbying groups and some of those dynamics, and looking at that in relation to the current boycott of Israel to try to get a sense of why the South African anti-apartheid movement seemed to be so successful while the BDS movement against Israel faces so many additional barriers. And I guess I've been interested in issues of Israel and Palestine for a really long time. I'm originally from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and grew up in a very progressive Mennonite community that had very close ties to different partners on the ground in Palestine. And so I grew up learning about the occupation and about groups like Christian peacemaker teams who do really cool work intervening in very dangerous situations to protect Palestinians from the violence of Israelis in places like Hebron. So I think I was exposed to these radical perspectives for quite a while. Also, I have had the opportunity to visit South Africa and Israel and to look at the very comparative histories of apartheid and settler colonialism. So maybe a good place to start would be some context about Israel-Palestine. We could obviously spend hours on that, but give a quick overview of both the broad political context on the ground and of the recent events that have caught international attention. Well, there are a lot of things happening right now, but it all goes back to very large-scale processes, again, of settler colonialism and apartheid. The state of Israel, which fragmented the Palestinian people when it was established in 1948, created millions over time of Palestinian refugees, fragmenting them into different categories. So pushing Palestinians into Gaza, into the West Bank, into East Jerusalem, and into exile in the diaspora. In all of these spaces, Palestinians face different challenges, but the root cause is Israeli settler colonialism. And so we actually saw this year Israel's largest human rights organization, Bet Salem, and a few months later, Human Rights Watch, both come out with 
landmark reports announcing that what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people as a whole, not just in the occupied territories, constitutes the crime of apartheid. Looking at these larger structures is really important because we can't look at what's happening in Gaza as being completely separate from the ethnic cleansing of Palestinian families in East Jerusalem. So that's a very high level. But in recent weeks, you know, we've seen a lot of different trends happening at the same time. We've seen a lot of Palestinians protesting these impending mass evictions in East Jerusalem. And in response, there was a very heavy handed repressive crackdown by Israeli authorities. Some of that crackdown involved violent raids on worshippers in Al-Aqsa Mosque during Rabbanon as they were worshipping. And these violations in East Jerusalem sparked an escalation of violence in the region. Hamas sent rockets from Gaza, and in response, Israel ended up embarking on a very violent, very heavy-handed, brutal assault on the civilian population of Gaza which is about 2 million people. Most of them are refugees or descendants of refugees who were ethnically cleansed from their homes in 1948. And they are trapped in a very densely populated area, which is controlled completely by Israeli authorities in terms of airspace, the sea, the kinds of things that are imported, the population registry, everything is controlled by Israel. And as a result of this very violent attack, hundreds of people, civilians, mostly were killed in Gaza, and about 10,000 people have been injured by Israeli violence over the last month. So, Russell, I want to hear about your activities in solidarity with the people of Palestine, specifically around the Help Gaza Breathe campaign. But maybe, Michael, you could start us off by giving some context for how the COVID-19 pandemic has been impacting people in the occupied territories. It's been very dire. Before any of the airstrikes happened, it was already a very awful situation. So Israel decided late last year, reports were coming out, that its very ambitious vaccination strategy was going to deliberately exclude Palestinians in the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza, but include Palestinians in East Jerusalem. So right away, 5 million people under Israeli occupation were expected to fend for themselves and find their own vaccines elsewhere. Now, this is a difficult task for one reason, because they're under occupation and there are severe limitations on logistics and their ability to source vaccines. The other thing is that the Palestinian Authority itself is very weak and is not a full government. It is essentially a subcontractor of the Israeli occupation. There are just so many barriers to accessing vaccines that they've been very late to the game and relying mostly on charity from the United Nations, some other countries. Now, I should note that this is against international law. The Fourth Geneva Convention says that an occupying power has to provide for the health care of the people that it is occupying. Israel will point to the Oslo Accords, which did divide some responsibilities, download responsibilities onto the Palestinian Authority to say that Israel doesn't have any legal obligations to the Palestinians. But there are dozens and dozens of human rights groups saying that that is false. Oslo does not overwrite international law, and there are provisions within Oslo that talk about coordination on vaccines. So Israel's decision to exclude the people it's responsible for from vaccines, people who live under dire conditions in the first place, I think was a very unethical, immoral, and illegal decision on its part. On top of that, Israel has been an impediment to Palestinians accessing their own vaccines. So that was the case before May. I think at that time, the vaccination rate was something like 2 or 5%, very, very low compared to Israel has one of the highest rates in the world. So right from the start, that discriminatory situation was there. Then we see that as a result of the assault on Gaza, I think something like 24 to 30 health facilities were damaged by Israeli attacks. Two of the senior doctors who are on the COVID strategy team were murdered by Israel in airstrikes. Just the medical system in general is out of resources. It doesn't have a lot of electricity, many facilities damaged. And actually, one of the facilities to be damaged is the only COVID-19 testing laboratory in the Gaza Strip. On top of that, you have, I think it's actually up to 100,000 people who are internally displaced within Gaza who fled their homes because of airstrikes or had their homes and neighborhoods destroyed, which means you have crowding in wherever they're 
finding refuge in schools and that kind of thing, which means that we're probably going to see super spread types of events because of that. So it's an apartheid system in terms of the healthcare outcomes, totally unable to meet the needs in the first place. And then the latest assault has just damaged every aspect of the healthcare sector in Gaza. What is the Help Gaza Breathe campaign? That is a campaign led by the CJPME Foundation, which is a charity. It's an independent organization separate from CJPME, but which CJPME supports. And so the CJPME Foundation and the Public Service Alliance Social Justice Fund together have launched earlier this year to help to get medical oxygen supplies to hospitals in Gaza to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. This is actually a follow-up to a campaign that was launched last year, also for various COVID-19 medical supplies like defibrillators and different equipment for Gaza hospitals. CJPME and members of the Canadian-Palestinian community got together to raise $165,000. So that was very successful, obviously. And so this was a follow-up to that. And then since the Help Gaza Breathe was launched with the escalation and violence and the even worse and more maybe immediate humanitarian situation, CJPME Foundation also launched an emergency aid fundraiser for more emergency things like food kits and medical kits and clothing launched that in the last couple of weeks and raised almost $70,000. So there's a lot of people in Canada who are very generous and very much willing to chip in to help people in in Gaza. And I think that's great. And we're very happy that Russell was able to contribute and to partner with us as well and to help us to reach our goal. So with the Help Gaza Breathe campaign, so far we've raised $115,000 and then the $68,000 for more emergency relief. So Russell, how did you become a runner? In 2018, I was in search for work, and it was hard for me to find work at the time. I was quite young, and I already had an honors Bachelor of Commerce and a postgraduate certificate in event management, so I knew I didn't want to go back to school. I don't mind disclosing that I was having mental health struggles, and my friend, he suggested that I start running. I gave it a try. I just started off with a simple 5K run, and I very quickly was enjoying running, and it became a coping mechanism for me to handle life. And I became quite good at it fairly quickly. I ran a half marathon within a few months. From there, I was loving running. Ever since then, it's just completely grown and grown. And running has become my meditation. It's become my way of finding peace in life. And without running, I find that I end up you know, not in the best places mentally. And so I use running as a vehicle in order to find peace and spirituality in my life. So I like to do as much of it as possible based on that. What kind of training did you do in the lead up to your recent run for Help Gaza Breathe? I had the 100 kilometer ultra marathon in November. And then in December, I did do quite a bit of training, but it wasn't until 2021 that we determined that we're going to do an event in support of Palestine. And I decided that May would be a reasonable time to do it. May is a good running month. So in December, I ran about 300 kilometers, and I believe I did about 700 or 800 kilometers on my stationary bike. And then from January until the end of April, I ran 2,023 kilometers, and I biked just about 800 kilometers in those four months. So it was a lot of hard work, but I always try to view hard work as fun. And I'm a big cardio guy, and so I was having a lot of fun with it. And then before I knew it, it was May 22nd. Tell me about the run itself. So it was five routes. So routes one, three, and five mainly consisted of Tommy Thompson Park slash the Leslie Spit. And then routes two and four mainly consisted of the Don Valley Trail. Throughout the ultra marathon. I truthfully had gastrointestinal issues. Early on in the run, about 13 kilometers in, there were a tremendous amount of gnats in the trail, and I actually ended up swallowing some. And so that was quite unnerving and not pleasant whatsoever. And so after that unfortunate incident, I was trying to fuel a lot in order to try and get that taste and feeling out of my body of the gnats. And I ended up fueling too much And that led to gastrointestinal issues. And so for a lot of the ultra marathon, I faced a lot of adversity, but 
I knew that with all the funds that had been raised and with all the amazing donors that we had and how much I had trained for this, that I had to keep going. I also knew in my heart that the Palestinians can't give up, and so neither can I. You know, what they're facing is astronomically more difficult than what I'm facing. And so in my heart, that's how I continued forward. So based on my 100K in November, I set a very challenging goal of 125K. And I gave everything I had. And at 110 kilometers, it, it wasn't safe to continue, truthfully. And so we decided to call it there. And yeah, I wouldn't recommend these distances to anyone. You need to slowly work your way up to reach these types of distances. I've certainly worked incredibly hard these past three years to be able to do this. And I'm incredibly grateful that my body has allowed me to do this. And I'm hoping that it will continue to allow me to do this in support of Palestinians for decades to come. And talk to me about solidarity and about why it has been important for you to translate your sympathy for the Palestinian cause into this remarkable hard work and dedication. I know that in my own life, I have incredible autonomy and freedom to choose what I want to do. And Palestinians are, are far from those circumstances. And so I'm treating my situation and the incredible autonomy and freedom that I have to try to support them the best I can. And so, you know, I have the ability to go and run long ultra marathons. And so I want to use that to support them because it's so incredibly unfair that they don't have that freedom. The constraints that they live with and the restrictions that they have, it's, it's so incredibly unfair. And so... I want to use my freedoms to try and help them the best that I can. And Michael, you talked earlier about your scholarly work related to solidarity with the Palestinian people. Maybe tell listeners a bit more about your current organization, the CJPME, to give people a sense of one way, at least, that the more political side of solidarity work can happen. Sure. So CJPME was founded in the early 2000s in the middle of the first intifada uh, that's an Arabic word meaning uprising, in that case by Palestinians in the occupied territories. When some people came together and decided that humanitarian aid was one thing, but what you really need is a political solution, that we need to put pressure on our government to change its policy in relation to Israel, to put pressure on that government to end the occupation, to end what became the siege in Gaza and human rights abuses. So they started doing different campaigns. They started to go to Ottawa and start lobbying politicians. And that's a lot of the kind of work that CJPME does. It is a lot of education work, creating policy papers and fact sheets and bringing those to lawmakers on Parliament Hill, but also educating the Canadian public. You know, we see that the Canadian media doesn't always do a very good job of educating people about the reality on the ground in Palestine. And so that's the kind of thing that CJPME has been doing for almost two decades, making sure that Canadians are up to date and that Canadians are involved and empowered to go to their own MPs and to raise issues of human rights violations and apartheid and ethnic cleansing and to continue to push. And, you know, over those two decades, I think we've seen significant progress in how Parliament has dealt with these issues, or at least certainly since the end of the Harper years. The latest escalation in violence last month in May, we saw the government take actually a bit more of a critical approach to Israel than we've seen in a very long time, specifically calling on Israel to stop settlement expansion and mentioning the communities of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, where Palestinian families are facing mass evictions to be replaced with settlers. And we saw, you know, a big group of MPs from across the political spectrum endorse a letter calling on Canada to impose sanctions on Israeli officials. So I think in the last number of years, we've seen significant progress. And I like to think that at least part of that is because of the work of groups like CJPME and many others like Independent Jewish Voices and many other groups in continually pushing on these issues, even when it seems as though there's not a lot of space and not a lot of interest to take a principled approach. And Michael, beyond important humanitarian campaigns like Help Gaza Breathe, how would you like to see people in Canada enacting solidarity with people in Palestine? 
I think that humanitarian aid is a very important component of it, given the challenges. But solidarity for CJPME has always been about politics, about using our voice to challenge our government to try to change policies which are complicit with the Israeli policies that oppress Palestinians. And so I hope that people who were generous enough to donate to these campaigns are also willing to raise their political voice as well and to help us put pressure on Israel to end apartheid, end the occupation, and to bring freedom for Palestinians. One of the ways that we show solidarity is by listening to Palestinians themselves and what they want. And so CJPME, for a very long time, has been a very active supporter of the BDS movement or the movement to boycott, divest and place sanctions on Israel until Palestinians are free. And I think this is a really great way that Canadians can be involved as consumers or in their university or their workplace to take concrete action to put economic pressure on Israel to end the occupation. I hope that people who are listening, that they continue to watch the developments on the ground. Even though there was a ceasefire a few weeks ago, all of the underlying issues that led to the recent escalation have not changed at all. The families in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan are still facing eviction. Israel continues to violently raid Al-Aqsa, daily violence against Palestinians, and it's just a matter of time before things get worse again. So there are things I hope that people will continue to pay attention and to follow groups like CJPME, which you can find at cjpme.org, but also groups like Independent Jewish Voices and so many others. Today, or the day at least that we're taping this, we saw Labor for Palestine and Labor Against the Arms Trade announce that 39 labor unions across Canada have been calling on the government to end arms sales to Israel. That includes national organizations, labor councils, locals. That's a fantastic initiative and people should follow those organizations. And if you're in a union, you should go to your union local and ask them to endorse the call to sanction Israel and to support other BDS campaigns. You have been listening to my interview with Russell Lavis and Michael Buchert. You can find out more about the Help Gaza Breathe campaign at cjpmefoundation.org, and you can find out more about Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East at cjpme.org. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.